to our first speaker, if I may. Um, and that is Sasha Arden, who's joining us from New York uh, to talk to us about their work on access to artistic content on CD-ROMs. Um, and in the introduction to this project, Sasha notes that CD-ROMs completely changed the realm of artistic possibilities in the 1990s. But I think in your nomination form, Sasha, you, you asked, you wondered um, whether anyone had experienced one in the last 10 years or so. And the likely answer is probably no, because uh, CD-ROMs are now an obsolete format, which means that potentially an important part of digital arts history is in limbo. So I'll say no more. I'll let you dive into the detail and, and tell us tell us about that. Over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And I, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I wasn't able to attend the IPRES conference or the awards ceremony. So I'm just really thankful to get a chance to um, represent this project and all of the wonderful um, artistic works that kind of come along with that and the chance to speak to an audience that might be a little different from my traditional audience coming from a fine arts conservation um, background. So I did this project uh, while I was um, still a student at NYU and finishing up my um, final year of internship. We usually call that a capstone placement interchangeable with internship and just to contextualize that a little bit um, i did share this project with um, a kind of part-time between tate and also working with um, uh, the preserving immersive media group that's based at tate and also working part-time at moma so i was kind of juggling these three big projects at the same time and um, I was really uh, honored that this CD-ROM kind of slice of all that work last year was um, valued enough to be nominated for this award. And I'm really, of course, honored that it was then recognized as, uh, as a winning project. And really my hope is that, you know, recognizing uh, these works will, um, and the research that I, uh, that I subsequently published, um, will help to kind of spread the, the ability for these works to live on um, in many different contexts. So um, let's go ahead and get started. As, as Sarah said in, in her introduction, you know, this um, CD-ROMs are like a very uh, important part of digital arts history. And the fact that they're locked in many cases on this uh, physical media has, um, really was brought to the attention of Pip Lawrenson uh, at Tate, head of collection care research at Tate, who is my supervisor for this project. And she was really keen to question how are CD-ROMs handled at Tate in particular? So um, some of the context and the case study is particular to Tate, but I, again, I hope that this can really be generalized to, to other contexts. Um, a little bit of background, um, you know, before CD-ROMs came to the scene, you know, it's kind of early personal computing days. And what really enabled uh, the, the production of CD-ROMs was uh, affordable personal computers, like the Macintosh that you see here, um, the development of software for multimedia content, like Macromind Director, which then subsequently went through several generations of going through Adobe, uh, sorry, Adobe Media uh, dir Director, and then also the development of uh, physical media that could, that could actually hold uh, all of this multimedia content and the data, large data sizes, you know, have kind of illustrated um, the restrictions of floppy disks at only 1.44 megabytes as a standard versus 700 megabytes, which, you know, really seems like, Yahoo, let's go, let's make some things. And that's exactly what happened. So artists really took up this new medium and started to run with it. You know, they're experimenting with new forms of visuality, of interaction, of storytelling. And it really set off a very productive period of um, you know, being able to do things in completely new ways. Um, and as we all know, you know, the, the internet was kind of coming into more public access alongside CD-ROMs and eventually superseded them. 
And so CD-ROMs were kind of, uh, they might be considered like a medium that's been left behind in many ways, um, both culturally and uh, technologically. And I'll speak a little bit more to that once we you know, get into some nitty gritty. Um, in terms of the research that I've done for this project, um, let's talk just for a second about where these CD-ROMs are coming from. In some cases, they were made directly by the artist who designed them, and they were kind of in-house produced on their personal computer with CDs, um, with discs that you know, may have come from the pharmacy on the corner uh, or you know, whatever, wherever they could buy them most cheaply. Um, so we don't know exactly how well made they are, how much they'll last through time. And many of you may be familiar with the very variable uh, timelines for physical degradation of, of discs. Um, and some of the uh, CD-ROMs that come into collections may have been uh, supplemental material to book publications or magazine publications. And um, again kind of quality control is questionable in terms of you know how those discs were pressed the materials that were used um, but again a, a, at a large view we have these two different streams coming into the collection and from the outside um, as a member of the public you could think well it's gone into the collection that's wonderful uh, it should be safe right <laughs> it's all good uh, there are people paying attention to that and of course, um, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but once you uh, look closer at what the collection is, it's often, um, as in the case of the Tate, uh, broken into several different siloed departments, such as a library, an archive that would, um, where, public, where published materials would be routed to, um, and then a separate you know, permanent art collection. And uh, at the Tate in particular, there are no CD-ROMs to date uh, as part of the public um, or the permanent art collection. So what we've really, what we saw as part of this kind of survey was um, there are CD-ROMs at Tate, but if I were a curator and I was interested in maybe, uh, you know, doing some research on a particular period of digital art history, or there was an artist who had done a project that seemed like an interesting thing to include um, in an exhibition, it would be difficult to, um, first of all, know that that CD-ROM existed um, in the Tate collection or just period. You know, there are issues around um, cataloging how multimedia uh, content gets cataloged alongside publications separate from them. How are those things linked when you're doing a search? Um, and then uh, in terms, uh, some challenges in terms of how those things are stored. You know, like I went through the process of requesting items through uh, various libraries that I have access to. And I may have tried to request the multimedia content and actually only got the book or vice versa. Sometimes they came together and sometimes they didn't. So it was challenging to actually get my hands on what I wanted. Um, and in some cases I would have loved to have uh, uh, access to special collections such as the Rose Goldson special collections um, at Cornell, which has a really incredible collection, but um, of course, those are restricted to in-person access and they couldn't be lent out, you know, for my research purposes uh, here in New York. So uh, New York City, that is. Um, and, you know, all of, all of these things kind of stacking up uh, really made it clear that uh, more, a little, like maybe some light could be shed on this more complex problem of, yes, it's in the collection, but what does that actually mean in terms of um, how we get to use those materials? So some of the other things, just quickly before I move on, are you know how do we um, if if there if we do get access to a disc, um, how are we uh, accessing them? Is are there computers available in the library or the archive? Are there staff who are um, kind of versed in those technologies and uh, who can help out users? you know, how if you run into a problem, who's going to be able to solve that and, and actually experience the work. And then in terms of the user's experience of those works, 
this is very important for artistic content versus maybe archival content like a uh, vintage word document, you know, the behaviors of um, interaction are very key. So uh, the, that's where like, some of the technological um, uh, stakes come into this question about access to artistic content. I just wanted to share also quickly this kind of graphic that I built out around the ecosystem that I've just described. At the center, we have the CD-ROM, but all of these things around it, you know, impact how we can experience and access it. We've got budgets and priorities. Uh, we've got collections policies, preservation policies, what is actually um, uh, uh, emphasized or prioritized for preservation and digitization. Um, and then access policies around lending or you know providing works in other formats and such like that. You have outside communities. Um, we've got users and programmers who are versed in technologies. We have users and advocates who are enthusiasts for these technologies who may become ad hoc archivists or uh, developing technologies to um, enable access. We have um, issues of copyright around the artistic content itself, around the software that is used to enable access in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a legacy environment. And then there are the tools, the actual tools that we use and uh, making sure that we can find those, that we can run them on the, the technology that we have um, available to us and um, that those are all sustainable as well. Um, so, big picture, when you're thinking about CD-ROMs and their preservation, there are kind of three main branches that you might choose. One is to invest in uh, legacy computers and make those available. Something like um, for, for CD-ROMs, it would be the mid to late 90s, to early to mid 2000s, you know, the aughts, maybe up to 2010 or so. Um, kind of that time period of computers will um, have the physical computational architecture to um, handle CD-ROM media like optical disk drives, um, software that would have been compatible with what was the content that's on the CD-ROMs. The second kind of strategy would be emulation, which is uh, basically a way to use our current day computers, the one that you're joining us on today, but using a software uh, called emulators or maybe a virtual machine um, to basically make your current computer a host to this older system. And then a third strategy that um, we bring from um, conservation, and then it also exists, I know, in a, a digital preservation um, context, we would call migration, um, you know, kind of, uh, taking the content from one archival format um, or legacy format and migrating it, moving it, transferring it, reconstructing it in a more sustainable medium that is um, accessible. So um, there was a case study artwork that we really used uh, for this research project. And uh, for that, we chose emulation just Kind of laying that out, I want to walk through uh, some of the work that we did. I want to say that um, before I move on, that migration <laughs> for CD-ROMs is really a big ask. It's a big undertaking, um, and uh, it's to date I don't know any migrations that have happened with CD-ROMs just because there are so many potential types of media that would need to interact. Um, you know, be very costly, very time consuming, and it's actually questionable just how sustainable that itself would be. So in many cases, emulation has been the choice for CD-ROM media. Um, and uh, there are a few examples that I can share toward the end of my talk uh, to direct you to, to other examples. So uh, I just wanna give a quick overview of this case study work that I focused on for this research project and introduce you a bit to the artist, um, Keith Piper. He was, um, is a leading figure in British contemporary art. And he was a founding member of the collective Black Art Group in the 1980s. Um, his practice really focuses on thematic concerns of race and history and culture 
And his works have taken form in a wide range of media, uh, including painting, sculpture, photography, installation, video, and um, computer-based interactivity. And this CD-ROM work, Relocating the Remains, that was commissioned by the Institute of International Visual Arts, or INOVA, in the late 90s. Um, and it was uh, uh, thought of as a sort of digital retrospective, um, which revisited Piper's works in the form of digital facsimiles that users could browse. Um, it had a lot of extra materials in it um, that were uh, part of a publication. So if, um, in the upper left corner of this slide, I have kind of an image of the CD-ROM and the book cover that were published at the time. And those are still available, actually. Um, my supervisor, Pip Lawrenson, was able to actually just purchase it on Amazon and have it sent to me in New York. And this is how it was. Um, it became my case study. It was you know, accessible on the market. Didn't have to arrange any special loan of an artwork or anything like that uh, while I was working from home in you know lingering pandemic uh, lockdown time. So um, it was really wonderful to have direct access to uh, this this uh, particular work, and it was a great case study, as you'll see. Um, and just to say that today, even uh, 20 years after this particular project, um, Keith Piper is still really engaged with exhibiting his technology-based works. And he is looking to keep the older ones running. So he was a very um, open partner in this, in this project and provided some really wonderful insights and feedback along the way. Um, so in terms of my work from home setup, I was using uh, a, a current day Mac laptop, uh, I had to uh, borrow an external optical disk drive uh, from my school NYU because of course, uh, internal disk drives were dropped in the mid 2010s as the market was really focusing on, you know, faster, slimmer, lighter uh, computers that were more portable. But of course I couldn't access uh, the CD-ROM content for relocating the remains directly on this operating system. The um, I don't need to get into the nitty gritty that it'll just bog us down in time, but um, the, the executable file was is just no longer um, uh, compatible with the OS that I'm using. So that was a dead end, but at least I could see in the finder um, kind of what files uh, were on the disk. I had a lot of um, uh, production files, asset files, and that was an interesting kind of first step into the waters of figuring out what was uh, on this CD-ROM. Next, I was able to use um, a virtual machine version of BitCurator, still on this Mac laptop, <laughs> um, uh, working in uh, uh, VBox, I think, and uh, using the disk type uh, command line tool, uh, I could see what kind of um, uh, file systems were on this. And for example, I could see that there's PC version and um, a legacy uh, Mac version on this uh, CD-ROM, as well as two audio tracks, um, like just classic audio tracks play, play on your you know, music app or in your CD player at home. So there's both data interactive data um, uh, content and the, this audio content to, to deal with on both Mac platform and PC platform. Um, next, I was able to use the Sheep Shaver emulator. And Sheep Shaver is a wonderful kind of open source community-driven um, software project to host, uh, to emulate Mac OS 9. Um, there are older versions that can do seven and system six and so on and so forth. Um, but Sheep Shaver was what I chose to work with for relocating the remains because of kind of the, the date, the era in which relocating the remains was released. This would be, you know, uh, it was kind of at the precipice of OS X and OS 9. Really like, okay, it's nerdy details. I will admit that. But when you're thinking about, um, like 
preserving the integrity of an artistic work, you want to you want to um, present it in an environment that is accurate to the time in which it was released. That could affect things like system sounds, or you know the shape of the mouse, or what would you know kind of behaviors that were that may have been manipulated or played with or taken advantage of in some way in those artistic works. Uh, if you take them out of that environment, you can lose the work um, and potentially run afoul of you know, copyright for the artist and, and things like that. Um, so in conservation, um, I guess that's where my conservation thinking really came in. It was not just about running the technical aspects of things, but it was also about considering the integrity of the artwork. So what I saw in uh, Mac OSI here, just two screenshots of different parts of the CD-ROM on the left is kind of its main menu um, uh, to navigate to different parts of the content. And on the right is uh, one of the landing pages for a particular work of Keith's that is included on this CD-ROM. Um, and I was creating documentation along the way as I was uh, looking in these emulators to kind of um, uh, compare what I was seeing and do an evaluation of what tools might be uh, working or not working and in, in, in what ways. Uh, next, I moved on to um, another uh, virtual machine, this time Windows 2000, again from, you know, that era of the late 90s, um, early 2000s when this piece was really out and circulating in the world. Uh, it was a little bit more difficult to access the PC version. Uh, there was a shortcut uh, when you first opened the disc, but then um, uh, I had to kind of look around. For, it wasn't working. So I had to look around for the actual executable file. And I did find that. Um, one interesting note is that with the PC um, running in this virtual machine, I was able to see the content directly from CD-ROM. And that gave me, uh, well, I was thinking it would give me a baseline for like, what is the real work? Uh, what is the, what, what am I comparing against when I'm evaluating all these different systems? We'll see a side by side in a minute, um, but already uh, here's recreations of similar screenshots from the Mac side. The kind of main menu is a little bit, uh, uh, I've, I've taken a screenshot from a different moment so you can see how it's kind of materializing in pixels. You might notice that it's a little bit less saturated um, from the Mac version. And um, as I was navigating around this, I was like, there are just some differences, but I'm not totally remembering. Went back and did some screen recordings. And um, I think in a couple of slides, there's some there's a side-by-side -side comparison and you can really see the differences. Um, but quickly, one other thing I was able to test was the emulation as a service, uh, kind of browser-based emulators. And um, I was given access very generously through the NYU libraries. They had um, uh, set up a node in their testing uh, that the emulation as a service platform for uh, the BOPS library's needs. So I could look again at OS 9 on this platform, and um, I can say one thing I noticed that uh, was important to me was that some of the interactions were a little bit laggy because of network issues somewhere along the way between NYU and their servers and my home computer um, and network. So. Um, things like those behaviors, if you're playing a game or again, like, you know, we just want to be paying attention to how those, um, how these artwork contents are um, as close as, as possible to the original or not. Uh, on the Windows side of things, um, I, I had access to Windows XP and it was a little more difficult to um, get access to the contents of the CD-ROM here because um, uh, I didn't have access to say install a software that would um, open up a disk image. So I was just stuck with, well, here I have a disk image, an ISO file, but I can't really open it. <laughs> and, you know, that, that was one of the um, things that, that came up for me um, in evaluating these tools. So here's the side-by-side -side on the left in the slide is the Windows 2000 virtual machine screen recording. On the right is the Mac. So you can see this difference in color and saturation. 
And also at the top, you can now see that on the PC version, um, it just goes straight into the main menu. But on the Mac version, there's this kind of much longer, lovely introductory um, uh, video that uh, explains, gives a little bit more context to the project and um, some more visual content. So on the, it's great that, you know, as a user in the early 2000s, late 90s, you, it didn't matter if you had a PC or a Mac at home, you could probably only afford one, you could still experience this content in some way. But, um, you know, what I'm really noticing now is on the bottom, on the Mac side, I can put my mouse over these boxes and they become animated. You can kind of see basically the equivalent of like um, the video clips. And on the left, I'm not getting that in the PC version. So a, a large chunk of the work is missing in my experience as a user. Um, so uh, that brought up a lot of questions about which version we might focus on for preservation. And we uh, set up a big Zoom call with Keith Piper, the artist, um, other people who had been involved in producing that work with Keith at Innova, and uh, the uh, person who really commissioned that work, uh, Gilan Tawadros, and other kind of stakeholders in Tate. And everybody was able to um, kind of see me, at least, interacting with the work here, um, walking them through different areas of the CD-ROM, and people asking questions and commenting. And I have to say that, um, you know, Keith was, again, very generous and very excited to see this work coming back to life and uh, excited about the possibilities of it being able to live on in some way. And folks at the Tate from different, these different silos were coming together and understanding, oh, we have all this content that is actually really valuable. It'd be wonderful to have a way um, to share that with our public and, or at least our internal stakeholders to begin mm -hmm. with. Um, so we'll see where they go with that, um, but there's a much more exhaustive version of this research that I've kind of um, put together and is thankfully now published and available to anyone um, on Tate's website now. And I made sure to include a lot of resources for you know people who are tasked with taking care of CD-ROM con uh, content as part of their work and may not have received. Um, digital preservation training, or it's just hard to piece together all of these different resources that, that exist out there. So hopefully this can be a one-stop shop for people to really get started, whether you're a professional or an enthusiast. Um, there are a lot of papers to read of, of other really incredible research projects that have happened. Um, I don't pretend that this is, you know, the last, uh, first or last <laughs> that will happen. Um, but I've hit my 25 minute mark, so I'll just pause there and maybe, uh, you know, there are other questions um, that I can, I'd be happy to answer um, from the audience. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sasha. That was tremendous. Um, I, I'm going to invite everybody just to give you a round of applause uh, for your wonderful presentation, but also for your award, because uh, I think that's well deserved. One of the things the uh, the judges noted um, in sort of sh shortlisting, finalisting the um, um, the uh, nominees, the finalists for this uh, category was that that yours was just so very comprehensive. You you talked about uh, the nerdy details, and Jen has put a comment in the chat saying nerdy details are good. I think the nerdy details were were what. A requ what's required, like how you need those to be able to sort of take the, the theory and make it sort of practice and uh, turn it into practice and make it practical. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I think um, I can see Sharon might have a, a, an immediate question, but so while uh, while she's asking hers, um, please everybody else do um, pop your questions in the chat box or put your hand up uh, and we'll come to you next. I think I could probably ask a lot of questions, particularly this is my <laughs> like, go on. This is my first year not being a judge for the awards. So this is fantastic to think about this. Particularly um a piece of work that it's 
Uh, so related to something I love, my undergraduate degree was on the history of art. So this is something that um, I really have enjoyed hearing about. Um, there's lots of things that I could ask you about kind of process. And um, I, I think one of the, the first things is obviously, um, what were the kind of key uh, lessons uh, through doing this work that you would pass on to other practitioners uh, and also perhaps what might you yourself do differently next time if you were approaching this project? Oh, thanks Sharon, those are good food for thought. Um, I think some of the, the key takeaways that I would pass on are really to bring in as, as, as many colleagues as possible, um, you know, more interest from more areas in an institutional setting often means, you know, more um, possibilities for, for a project or an initiative to move forward in some way. Um, whether that's somebody that says, oh, I have this resource here, or somebody might have a little bit more, um, you know, let's be honest, like clout in getting uh, funding for something. Um, and that is one of the practical aspects of how how to provide um, access to works. It's as I as I kind of tried to outline with the ecosystem. It's so many parts that you have to bring together, and it's often difficult for you know one manager or even one department to really be be able to do that um, in in a preservation setting. In terms of things I do differently. Um, you know, I, it would have been really wonderful to incorporate more case studies. Um, kind of coincidentally, I was working with other CD-ROM content um, at, in my internship at MoMA, and I had access to more a kind of in-person CD-ROMs through their library. And I noticed there were a lot more issues with some of the content that I was looking at through there. Um, so it would have been great to expand the case study um, spread with a few more um, uh, instances where there were problems and maybe how to solve those potentially. Um, but the, the challenge with that is that as many problems as you could describe, there are 10,000 more that will come up that I, you know, wouldn't <laughs> that I wouldn't encounter because each CD-ROM project really, uh, in terms of art stuff, is very unique. Thanks, Sasha. I think what you said about um, involving as many people as you possibly can um, in the in your journey uh, is rings true, not just for sort of um, artistic artworks on CD-ROMs, but is a, it's a general kind of rule of thumb, isn't it, for digital <laughs> preservation. I was going to see if Nancy might be able to comment on that because Nancy, you've had oodles of experience um, working uh, in the field and um, this must ring true for for you and the, the three-legged stool, for example. It's, it's like a comprehensive approach, isn't it? You can't just do one thing on your own. You can't just solve it with one a, a, like a single person or a single approach it, it takes it takes all three or it takes a, a a more comprehensive approach doesn't it it does i was sitting here listening feeling very nostalgic because i both predate and postdate the example um, <laughs> um when i shifted from digital archives to digital preservation I started to listen to these very closely because I tend to get the results after you're done your work, Sasha. <laughs> so um, here's the package and here's the thing. From a preservation planning perspective, more than one approach is absolutely necessary. We were using emulators at the National Archives just to get access to a terminal to have to connect with a, a computer center. So it's a it's a function of computer science that we use in all different kinds of ways. I think for the long term, I always wonder about in 50 years, when will emulation become just as impossible as the computer museum approach? So as a near term and like, how do you document for the very, very long term so that the future can still appreciate it, even if they have to treat it like a, you know, reconstruct this thing from the past to do it. But it's a it, it, fabulous example of the, the level of uh, 
the depth and the uh, comprehensiveness of strategies that you need to do. And I think that your the lessons learned about repeating it, because similar to digital humanities, digital art has been a challenge for the, and then you have to do it 50 times more, So, <laughs> and, and what's replicatable and what's not. But it's a very good model, and, the, and to have all the resources is really, is really great for people. Super, thanks Nancy. Um, well, I'm going to pause just for a moment uh, to see, oh, there's, is this a comment or a question, Jen? The importance of that interaction with the original artist came out strongly in your presentation. I wondered, Sasha, whether you would recommend that should be one of the first priorities in a project like this. Is there a benefit to speaking to them earlier or perhaps you did that too? Yeah, that's a wonderful observation. And we we did speak to Keith um, kind of early on just to make sure, you know, yeah, we're, we're, we're interested in using your project as a case study. Are you good with that? Or are we repeating work that's been done somewhere else? I, we had heard that Keith was in conversation with um, a couple of other organizations in the UK to, uh, to actually look at relocating the remains. But uh, long story short, he was very happy for us to, to focus on this work. And um, we, we did kind of keep in touch with him a few times for questions. And, you know, I, for time's sake, I really only focused on the, the big to do at the end where everybody came together to look at the work um, as a group. But yeah, of course, um, that's a huge part of working with living artists and uh, get their input first and um, or maybe not first, but, you know, it's they're part of the process. It's it's our responsibility as conservators or preservation specialists to uh, understand the work, first of all, you know, intelligently speak about what you know, what what we understand and um, maybe propose some strategies that we would recommend um, for carrying the work forward. Um, but very much like working with uh, living stakeholders, whether that's the artists themselves or uh, uh, a foundation, um, you know, uh, studio assistants who work very closely or producers in many cases with technological works. You know, I've also worked a lot with um, AR and VR works and, you know, in many cases, the artists themselves aren't creating those technologies. They're they're doing the creative direction, and someone else is doing that. But you know, it's it's conversations all around with many people who have different types of knowledges and um, things to offer. Great stuff. Well, thank you very much for that and for your questions, everybody.